it's always a bad idea to go last. <laughs> Partly because the speech is always overrun. There's a danger that everybody else has said the interesting stuff. Do you need this mic closer? Um, there's a danger that everybody else has said the interesting stuff, and I can feel the room sort of itching to ask questions at this point. So um, Alina asked me to be a bit provocative, which I will, I will try to be, and in the spirit of uh, what Nick said at the beginning, that he was making some horrendous generalizations. Um, <laughs> I will make some horrendous generalizations about their research, um, and I might even raise the bar to outrageous generalizations. <laughs> um, but just to say, to start with, I think this is a, a very valuable, interesting, important piece of work that IDEA has developed here. There's, there's not enough work being done on understanding how, how political parties develop. But I will take a very specific perspective on this, which is one of um, international party assistance. What does this mean? for practitioners, for implementing agencies who work with political parties. And seven or eight years ago, um, the NDI did a couple of very interesting papers um, uh, in, I think, Peru and Bolivia called something like um, what causes political parties to develop pro-poor policies. And that seems to go to the heart of the question here. How, how do you get parties to change? And secondly, does it matter if they're they're programmatic or not. Um, the paper set out very strongly, there's an unarguable case about the benefits of programmatic parties to do with good governance, um, genuine choice of voters, they're more likely to address issues of poverty. But what's in it for the parties? Political parties are designed to capture as many votes as possible. And they will look for the, the easiest route to, to getting as many votes as possible. And this is at the core of the challenge for, for international parties is you want them to be democratic, you want them to have broad-based membership, but ultimately they're interested in, in winning votes and winning elections. Um, and there is a, a tension between, um, oh, well, I mean, in, in most developing countries at the moment, the quickest route to generating votes is often through patronage and through identity politics. Um, but if you look at, and this is often seen as a, a terrible thing, but if you look at the the political party system that exists in Western Europe, in North America, it's based on, it developed through points of identity at the end of you know, the, the 19th century. There were common points of identity which were mainly to do with class, and the political parties built themselves around those class interests. And political parties at the time were seen as the best way of achieving solutions to the problems that you faced as an individual, that, that you would you know, cohere with other people that you agreed with, find uh, common points of uh, interest, develop policies around them, go to Parliament, try to change things to benefit you. That was seen as the best route forward. Hundred and some years on, political parties don't look like an obvious solution to a lot of the problems that, that people are facing. Um, in an era that prizes immediacy and individual reward, political parties, the parliamentary process looks slow, looks cumbersome, any reward is aggregated, it's, it takes time. So political parties now have a, a, you know, an extra high hurdle to get over. They have to convince people that they are part of the solution and that then that political party will help um, those individuals. Um, and I'll just, I mean, I will keep this as brief as I can, but I think there are sort of four or five points which I'd make in terms of um, this research and uh, its effect on, or, or issues for international party assistance generally. The first is that an awful lot of international party assistance is designed to help political parties win campaigns. Um, there is, as I'm sure everybody knows, there are two broad strands of international party assistance work. One is the work which tries to help all the parties and strengthen the party system. And then there is a strong trend of sister party work. Um, uh, parties in Western Europe, North America, working with their ideological counterparts. Now that sister party approach is very much designed to help the parties win elections. Now all of that work at the same time will encourage the parties to make their systems more robust in terms of internal democracy, in terms of developing policy, in ter terms of competing on the basis of manifestos. But if you're a, a political party on the receiving end of this, you know, the campaign techniques which are given to you by, by and, and I have to say the NDI and the IRI are exceptionally good at this because America is better than anywhere else in the world at campaigning, um, at innovating in terms of campaign techniques. <laughs> the, although this is being given at the same time, if you can take the stuff which is going to help you win the election and ditch the stuff which makes it cumbersome for you to run a political party, you will do. 
you have to see an incentive in having a democratic political party, in having a broad-based membership, in having a robust policy-making process. Secondly, in terms of that sister party approach, the, the political parties in emerging democracies that we see around the world, um, there is an assumption often that you, know, you should have a, a party system which is on a sort of left-right spectrum. But as I said earlier, you know, these were the points of identity that existed in, in Northern Europe and America at the end of the 19th century. They don't exist in developing democracies. The points of identity are more often uh, regional, ethnic, tribal, religious, and playing those through often is more divisive. These are the bases on which parties will appeal for votes because it's easy to do so, and it's the most obvious point of identity in many societies. I was doing some work in Bahrain a few years ago before the Arab Spring and sat down with a couple of politicians, one Sunni, one Shia, who were bemoaning the advent of a you know, tiny bit of parliamentary democracy because once they had a parliament, the parliament became the crucible for the Sunni and Shia to express their divisions and their dislike of each other. And it has actually intensified, their argument was, it intensified those divisions rather than healed them. Um, the third point is the very antagonistic relationship between civil society and political parties mm -hmm. in most developing democracies. Um, now, there are all sorts of reasons for this, you know, an awful, to, to you know, caricature this, you know, an awful lot of civil society seems to be based on the, the, the assumption that all politicians are venal, self-serving scumbags. Um, and uh, a lot of politicians regard civil societies as entirely unaccountable. You know, who are you telling me what to do? How many people voted for you? Now, that, that antagonism exists to, a, to, to some extent partly because, you know, if you're a politician or if you're running uh, a civil society organisation, at some point in your career, you took a choice that the best way to achieve political change was going to be through the political process or through the civil society. Now, that, that antagonism isn't, a, a lot of party assistance tends to work around it rather than addressing it. Um, in the last few years, there has been a growth in what's been called parliamentary monitoring organisations, which you can see signs of things changing in places like India, in Uganda, uh, where there is, uh, politicians are starting to see the value in a parliamentary monitoring organisation and a civil society organisation, if you like, providing a neutral um, verdict on the performance of politicians of political parties. Um, fourthly, and this is a point which, which uh, Nick mentioned, um, you sort of hope that the, the seeds of uh, destruction are, are, are innate in clientelistic patronage politics. It is expensive to run a clientelistic political party. I was in Uganda uh, two or three weeks ago, and the NRM there, the dominant party, um, is now looking at the next election and we, the work we were doing was to do with you know, trying to strengthen the opposition parties. Um, a lot of the conversation about the NRM was whether they could afford to win another election because the, the winning an election was getting more and more expensive. And if you are running that sort of system, you have to be... An Ms. Museveni is an incredibly skillful politician. To manage all the different groups and play them off against each other and keep their expectations met largely through patronage and clientelism, is incredibly impressive. But it is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, you know, a, as government goes on, so it will be more difficult to meet all of those demands. And you sort of hope that the seeds of the destruction are in the, the, the nature of that system. Um, and then the final point, which um, I hope we'll discuss a bit more, is the, uh, and Lewis mentioned this as well, is the virtue of constituency-based electoral systems against list PR systems. Mm -hmm. There is an argument, as Nick's put it, that, that you can get more discipline, more cohesion in political parties if you have a list PR system. But also there is a huge value to MPs doing constituency work and a huge expertise they build up um, from doing constituency work, which we shouldn't lose sight of either. And I guess my point is that the context is everything on those sorts of decisions. So to conclude, I think the, the final point I'd make is just that a lot of international party assistance is premised on the assumption that political parties will, of course, be agents of development. This is, this is the right thing to do. Surely, surely they would do this. Um, but you can't assume that. A lot of parties will. But political party development needs to be overtly political. It needs to start from an understanding of what political parties are, what they seek to do, and how they operate. And you need to engage with the politics of party organisation and then seek to change it. But it needs to be overtly political rather than primarily development. 
thank you very much um, to all of you for these uh, very, very, very um, comprehensive remarks and very thought-provoking um, comments. I will now open the floor to questions, and if I, if I may ask you to please wait for the roving microphone, and also when you ask questions, if you can please identify yourself, and please remember also that uh, this is all in the public domain, and hopefully we will also be having questions from people outside of this room. 